Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 1. Everything is written under the sun, an earthly view, not a heavenly view. I said in my heart, and Jeremiah says, the heart is wicked. And who can know it? But we're talking about a man that got wisdom and understand, uh, wisdom and knowledge from God himself. And this is what many people say, well, I'm going to let my heart speak. I'm going to let my heart guide me. And you got an earthly and never a heavenly means when you let your heart lead your way. And your heart, Jesus said, there, there's adultery, there's fornication, there's murders, there's theft, there's lying, there's stealing. Never let your heart guide you. I said in my heart, go to now. I will prove thee with mirth. Now mirth is social merriment. Like you would get with the holidays. Family. Uh, parties. Eating. And the proof. Solomon is writing to us. I'm going to see how great this earth and this world. And life and riches and fame and foolishness and folly. I'm going to see what everything can do for you. And then I'm going to record it. So he says, I said to social merriment, to a family outing, to a family holiday, to the office party. Therefore, enjoy pleasure. I'm surprised I don't get many worldly Christians quoting for the book of Ecclesiastes. They don't even know the book of Ecclesiastes is this. And if you want a book to say, go eat, drink, be merry, and party, and have a good time, here's your book. But you better study all the scripture, because you're going to find a remarkable conclusion when we get to chapter 12. He says, enjoy pleasure. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. I wouldn't be going running to the book of Ecclesiastes to be proven any values of life. Uh, Hebrews 11, verse number 2. I know it's in there. Uh, 25. Hebrews 11, 25. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God, Jewish people, than to join the pleasures of sin for a season. Moses was raised up in the kingdom of Pharaoh. Many years later, we got a king of Jerusalem. He said, you know what? I'm going to live all those pleasures. And I'm going to write it down. And the Holy Spirit said, we'll put that right between Proverbs and the Song of Solomon. He said, I'm going to enjoy pleasure. And behold, I wonder what modern Bibles say. I don't look it up. This also is vanity. So Hebrews 11, 25 is correct. Solomon says, I'm going to have that social merriment. I'm going, to, I'm going to have the family reunion. I'm going to have the family time. I'm going to I'm going to have the office parties. I'm going to let my heart guide me. He says, you know what? That's vanity. Vanity means emptiness. Better make sure you, you get to chapter 12 at the close of Ecclesiastes about this book. I said on, of laughter, you know, laughter, mirth, it is mad. And of mirth, verse 1, what doeth it? What's the end result? There is more sorrow and pain and anguish in the world than there is laughter, enjoyment. They build big hospitals. For pain and suffering. They don't.
build big merriment, mirth, social merriment. You say, well, you, you've got the big casinos. Yeah, and inside there, people lost all their money. I know of a man in, in Las Vegas. He's got a church. He witnesses on the strip. And his church is housed by many people who, who come to Las Vegas to earn the fortune. And now they're, they're, they're dead, broke, homeless, or just barely surviving. Their life of the casino ended up in vanity. Laughter, it is mad. And people pay comedians to make them laugh. And then when you look at the end of the life of the comedian and, and the drugs and the sex and the booze and the alcohol, and, and, and the torture of their bodies, they never really laughed themselves. They were paid to, to make people laugh, but their lives were laughable. I saw in my heart again, verse 1, to give myself unto wine. I'm surprised I haven't heard any drunkard quote that verse. I'm going to see what wine. I, I tried the social mess. I mean merriment. All right, let's try wine. Eat, drink, and be merry. All right, I tried the merry. Let's try the drink. Yet equating my heart with wisdom. I drank responsibility. As they say with alcohol today. Solomon never overdid it. He says, I'm going to try the wine, but he didn't get inflamed by the wine. And to lay hold on folly, foolishness. I tried the wisdom, let's do the folly. Till I might see what was that good for the sons of men, which they should do under the heaven all the days of their life. Solomon lived in the world of one to ten. One, the homeless. Ten, the richest. One, the drunkard. Ten, the clean, sober man. And he wrote it down. If anybody says, I'm going to go for the life of the gusto, I'm going to sow my, my wild oats. I want to know what life's all about. Why is he can ask he's not taught in a teen Sunday school class? Because this would be a wonderful, great book to teach. Entirely. But all those, I want to go see what life has to offer. Here it is. Okay, now the riches and the great works. I've made me great works. And he's going to tell you about it. I builded me houses. He built the temple. He built a house for, for his wife, the, the Pharaoh's daughter. He built his house. He built the judgment house with, with the ivory throne overlaid with the gold. I planted me vineyards. And then vineyards were rich stock and wealth and popularity in the region of Israel. I made me garden and orchards. And I planted trees of them of all kinds of fruit. The guys sent the Navy out and they brought back peacocks and apes and all kinds of things. You would say when you read that list, why on earth? Ecclesiastes. He had his own zoos. He had to when it said they brought apes and peacocks and other 
The man built a zoo. The man built a garden. Plural. This is all plural. The, he built vineyards. He built houses. He built the temple. I made me pools, plural, of water. He didn't have one swimming pool. He had pools of water. To water with with, with therewith the wood that brought that bringeth forth trees. He built water reservoirs and collected the water for the reservoirs for his trees. He built for his gardens, for his vineyards, for his orchard. <clears throat> he built and made artificial irrigation. So we talk about, or they talk about the hanging gardens of Babylon. I can imagine this area was absolutely beautiful. And that with the kings of Judah, though there were some kings in Judah that were right and, and, and proper between God, and there were some that were not, and then destroyed by the Babylonians. Within time, all that Solomon made and all that Solomon did, we're reading in chapter 2, was destroyed. So what's the big deal? All the money and time and effort he put into verses 4, 5, and 6. Well, I'm going to go over to Jerusalem and I'm going to find the footprints of Jesus. You're not going to find them. I'm going to go over to Jerusalem. I'm going to see where the Catholics say Jesus died. I'm going to say where the Catholics saw where he was born. I'm going to see where the Catholics say without reading the Bible. All right, how about this one? I want to go over to Jerusalem. I want to see the houses. I want to see the vineyards. I want to see the gardens. I want to see the orchards. And I want to see the artificial irrigation that Solomon, they're not there. And if they are, they're not. Well, what do you, Babylon in the book of, in the book of Jeremiah came and destroyed it all. Whatever was there, it was destroyed. So, <clears throat> in Solomon's search of woe, the great world, and the great things, verses 4, 5, and 6, where are they? They're gone. They've been plowed over. They've been destroyed. They've been burned. So it didn't do them no good. I got me servants and maidens. And if this was today, he would be cussed down. He would be hampered. He'd be written as a sovereignist. He'd be written as, as a slave monger. He would be harassed. He would be destroyed by the media because he has servants and maidens. I had servants born in my house. Dedicated servant. The Queen of Sheba said, man, the, the, the apparel, the, the, they, they love what they did. They love Solomon. And, and the extent of his kingdom, it was marvelous and great. And go back and read it. We're not going to. Also, I had great possessions. There you go. Of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. So he would make the Texans a little hamburger joint compared to what he had. He had the best cattle in Jerusalem. And there is wealth and fame in the state of Texas for the cattle and the cattlemen. Solomon had his own cowboys. And I am going to assume, I would assume probably Solomon had his own burger joints because they could eat burgers. That didn't defile the law. Solomon had his great steak restaurant because you could eat steak. That was in the law. And with these cattle, Solomon would dine on the greatest beef and steak and hamburger. 
in the best names of state was brought to Solomon at no cost. He lifted up. I gathered me also silver and gold. And the Bible tells us that I forget it was the silver to go. It was just as rocks in Jerusalem. People come along. What's that rock over there? That's just a piece of gold. What's that rock over there? That's a piece of silver. Wow. I wish I could find gold and silver where I live. Just pick it up as a rock. Money and gold and silver and iron and brass to Solomon was just added to the stockpile. And particular treasures of kings and of providence. This is a not common treasure. The Bible says that the, the Queen of Sheba brought spices that no one even knew were spices. They had no idea. And with it, she would probably have to bring a recipe. And, and what do you do with this spice I never heard of? They, there's one time they brought agam trees to Solomon. Uh, well, all the agam trees, you can't find them no more. He turned them into musical instruments and I believe uh, some kind of terrorism. There were things that were brought to Solomon that were unique. And it looks like in some cases, but, but those trees, that they, they were made obsolete. They, they tore it all down, so the only ones left would be Solomon. He had ivory. He had an ivory throne made. And the PETA and the animal activists would have killed Solomon for the ivory. He made his throne. And then he goes and takes gold and covers the throne. Ivory throne? Wow. What's that throne? I, I, that's my throne. That's my ivory throne. It's covered with... It's gold. I know. I covered the ivory with gold. It, it was the standard of American money, Solomon pennies. I don't need pennies. I got, I got me singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. He had bands, he had orchestras, he had sympathies, he had his own radio. Talk about having a radio station. He had the performers right there. You know, he didn't turn the dial on the radio. All right, I, I, want, I want this style of music. And then they would all change it and start playing this style of music. Oh, wait a minute, okay, stop. I want, to, I want to start praising the Lord right now. And then they would stop and, and they would start praising the Lord. Oh, wait a minute, stop. I, I want something down and depressing because I don't feel very well. And they play something, that, the blues. And it wasn't broadcast over a little box or a little stereo in his in his chariot. They were live on the scene in Solomon's presence. So I was great. And yet you don't read about Solomon. I never heard about Solomon in the public school system. Check it out. Get yourself secular school books from kindergarten all the way up to 12th grade and search all those pages with a microscope and see if you find Solomon in his greatness. They will bypass the Egyptian pharaoh that tortured and, and served the, the, the Israelites with rigor because we sure can't tell you that the African people served others with slaves. But we got to worry about the African American who were slaves. But don't teach the kiddies that the Egyptians 
had slaves and had them serve with. Don't teach them that part. Don't teach them among the pharaohs that there was a Hebrew man that was the son of the pharaohs by adoption found in the river and he led those slaves out by Jehovah with great miracles and great powers and that all the gods of the Egyptians were put down by Jehovah by the plagues and wonders of Egypt. Don't include that in your school. Don't you dare teach. Don't you even dare teach creation in the school. I was great. But they'll teach you about Alexander the Great. The Great Pyramid. I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. I didn't lose it. There was nobody as wise as I am, Solomon saying, ever in Jerusalem. And when we read an account, when God gives the blank check to Solomon, ask anything you want. And he says, listen, I want to know how to judge your people. And God says, I'll give you wisdom. I'll give you knowledge. And your wisdom will outdo all the wisdom of all the wise people. That whatsoever my eyes desired. Here's a blank check. God gave Solomon a blank check. Solomon gave himself a blank check. The lust of the eyes, there it is. I kept not from them. Whatever my eyes, oh, I liked it. It's mine. David did that. Solomon's father did that. That woman, she's pretty. Bring her to me. Ahab did that by murder. The vineyard. I mean, at least he asked for the vineyard. It was Jezebel that had him kill Naboth. Now, I don't know if Solomon went that far. But he says, whatever my eyes. I don't know if he saw something that was somebody else's. That's mine. Now. I don't know if he did that. But he said, his word, what's over my eyes desire, I kept it not from them. I coveted and I went and got. Not many people in the world can say that even to today. I withheld not my heart, there is again, with any joy. If it pleased me, if it made me happy, it was mine and I did it. Boy, I think this would be a great Sunday school book to teach to young Christians, young teenagers, if you do all 12 chapters and do all 12 chapters respectfully. Because the young teenage, that's what I want. I want, I want to be in a band. I want the money. I want the fame. And I, we could jump over to chapter 12 right now, and we're not going to. We're going to do it within time. And if you don't listen, follow along. If the Lord tarries, and you don't want to get to chapter 12 with us, that's your doing. That's your failure. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor. He still worked. Whatever he did, he labored to do what he did. There are people in America today, they get all kinds of things and they don't work for it. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had brought. The houses. The vineyard, the garden, the orchard, the trees, the artificial, uh, uh, the artificial uh, irrigation, the servant, the gold, the silver, the treasure, the bands, the music, 
the wine, the mirth. I looked at all that. And on the labor that I had labored to do, and everything we read from verse 1 to verse 11, all was vanity. Where's the musical bands? They're dead. Where's the singers? They're dead. Some went to Abraham's bosom. Some went to hell. I've already said, where's, where's the houses? Where's the vineyards? Where's the garden? Can I go there? You can't go there today and see him. Vain. Where's the body of Solomon today? In a grave somewhere. His soul's in glory. I'm not sure if he's one of the bodies that resurrected after Jesus resurrected. Because Peter says in Acts chapter 2 that David's body is still in the grave. But we know his soul is in glory. Because Abraham's bosom was taken up with Jesus. These vineyards, these, these orchards are not doing Solomon any good right now, today. All was vanity and vexation as an irritation of spirit, man's spirit, not the Holy Spirit. Was the gardens watered today? Are my servants feeling good today? Do some of them need medicine? Have we paid them? Are they, they are they being fed like they're supposed to? You, you got to worry about them. The more labor I put into it, the more labor I got to put into it. The more labor I got to put into it. The more labor I got to put into it. The more labor I got to put into it, and then it's just destroyed after death. And there was no profit. There's that expression, under the sun. In the life of the earth and the world, not heavenly, not Holy Spiritly, not God, but in the world under the sun, there are, or were, in Connecticut where I grew up, there were many farms. There were many dairy farms. Cattle. And you can go anywhere in the woods of Connecticut, and you can walk in the woods, and you'll come across many stone rock walls. They're everywhere in Connecticut. And those stone brick rock walls did not evolve. The road, the, the the walls didn't roll themselves to be a wall. It took labor. It took men. And when a man would plow a field, he would dig up rocks every year. Connecticut grew rocks. And they would take those rocks, they would gather them, they would build their walls. And those walls would be, this is my property, this is your property, this is a pen for the animals, this is where, you know, for the pigs, for the chickens. For the, for the cows, for the cattle. And you go walk in those places and the walls are falling down. We saw that in, in Proverbs. You wouldn't see any, or if you did, they were dilapidated. Farmhouses and buildings, they're gone. And there's trees. And the trees grow well because of the fertilization of the cows and chickens and pigs and the farming of the land. But there's no farming going on and there's no dairy cows anymore. It's overgrown. It's, it died out when the family died out. And there, there was, a, there was a, a politician. I'm not getting to politics. I'm just saying. There was a politician and his family in Connecticut is known, I think it was for dairy cow, dairy, milk, and cows. And it was a good farm, good family, you know, and the son went off to college and became a politician. 
and left the family farm, left the family works and all that, the dairies and the cows and all that. And then within time, if not already, father's land is not going to be a cow's anymore. It's not going to be dairy. It's going to go away. It's going to rot away or some big industry or maybe a casino in Connecticut is going to overpass the land. There are two major casinos, as I know, when I left Connecticut. And they're built on tribal lands, Indian reservations, where Indians once used to live, hunt, play, survive, and family. Now there are big hotels and big, let's steal all your money. What is on that Indian reservation today, those casinos, is what's not on that land years and years and years ago, even before the Europeans came. And there are, there are Native American families that did all they could to build up their tribe and build up their family and take care of their people. They've died. They've been buried, and whether they're in hell or heaven, waiting the great white throne judgment, if their name's in the books, they'll go into glory, however it be. They're gone. And if they were to resurrect, they'd be quite shocked to find what's on their property today. And what's on their property today, if the Lord tarries, who knows what will be on that property tomorrow. There is labor, there is life, there is putting all to the all, and everything under the sun within time. One more thing, we'll close. In Connecticut, where I grew up, and I, I forget where it is, but you, you can find this all over Connecticut and New England. But I'm, I'm, I got one Pacific one in I think it's Norwich, out in the outskirts of Norwich, Connecticut. There's a barn. Half the barn has decayed and the other half is leaning. It's not used no more. But at one time, that was a farm that stood upright. It was a farm that was well maintained. It was, it did whatever, pro uh, it did whatever process that the farmer built that barn for. I don't know whether chicken or cows, whatever he built that barn, it, <coughs> excuse me, it had that purpose. I don't know what it looks like today, but you know, we left Connecticut 2011. Like I said, half that barn was decayed and the other half was leaning. It may have fallen over by now. And that farmer and his family were to resurrect today and look, that's not the intent I built that for. And I, I built that thing for, for me, for my children, my grandchildren, and my great-grandchildren. But under the sun, under weather, under time, under the kids don't care and move off to another business, vanity. Solomon is going to give all his, all his, most of his wealth and his fame to his son, Rehoboam. And Rehoboam splits the nation of Israel that has not got back together since. And Jeroboam takes over and he develops the two cat, golden calves and throughout all the thing until the Assyrians come and, and take captivity of Israel north, the sin that Jeroboam made Israel to do. The sin that made Jeroboam, Jeroboam made Israel to do. The sin that Jeroboam made Israel to do. That's not the intent that Joshua, that's not the intent of Moses, that's not the intent of what God had man to do. And Solomon is looking at it like, yeah, I did great, did a wonderful, great job. What about tomorrow? There are people who built their houses and we keep getting hurricanes and they're not stopping. 
We got another hurricane, Iota. And they're saying this hurricane comes up, it's going to do much damage than the last one. I forget the name. On the west coast of Florida. Because the west coast of Florida has already been hit by hurricanes. Time and weather and the growth of children doing other things. Solomon said, I did all this great work. And if you could resurrect Solomon for one hour and to go back into Ecclesiastes chapter 2, what do you think he would think? Vanity is all vanity. Vanity.